Good morning. It is a lovely rainy day. And so I thought this was the perfect opportunity to go over my list of seeds that I'm planting this year, uh, why I chose those, uh, where some of them came from, and then also explain how I did my gardening plan for uh, the vegetable garden this year uh, and how I'm going to try to keep that in check, uh, knowing my dates for everything that's going into it. So uh, let me get started by uh, introducing you to, here we go, my famous and wonderful lists. I love to make lists so much. Uh, I make lists of my lists, basically. But the lists really have a great way of keeping me in check. And it just, it calms my mind because then I'm able to just kind of look at everything on one piece of paper or a few pieces of paper, depending on how big the list is. And, uh, gives me a sense of control that I know what's going on because there are so many seeds that are going in and there are so many dates uh, and harvest dates and I need to know uh, the best times for planting, the best time for harvesting, uh, when I need to have seedlings getting ready in order to go out into the garden so that there can be a constant flow in my garden and I don't have any wasted space. Uh, so there's so much to think about there that having a list is just really, really nice. So I have a few different lists. I have a list of all the varieties of my vegetables that I'm planting. And then I also have another list that I actually put on my calendar that is more of a, this is when you need to be doing things, Ruth, and uh, when you need to be getting things done. So I have a couple of different lists. Uh, I even have a, a tree list of all the different fruit trees and uh, nut trees that I ordered this year that are going to be going into the new food forest. So true to form, <laughs> I can't go small. Uh, I was going to start off with doing an orchard and now I just realized that I can't, I can't not do a food forest. It is going to be a food forest. We were going to do just an orchard and I was going to let the grass go up to the trees and it was just going to be kind of like this field with trees growing and I just can't bring myself to do it when I know better. I know that if I put alliums under the trees, uh, the trees will have uh, more of an immunity boost. I know if I put pollinators under the trees, uh, the trees will have a higher rate of pollination. I know that if I put things like comfrey plants underneath, that I will be getting nutrients dropped on top of the soil and building up that soil and building up the health of the trees. There's so many things that a food force is good for. Um, and so I just can't stop myself because I know that it's good and why wouldn't I do it if I know about it? So, uh, it is going to be a food forest that is going to be a lot more work than doing just an orchard. Uh, but that's okay because it's plants, it's gardening. I love doing all of it. And so it's really not work for me. It's more like play. So here is uh, the list of vegetables that I'm going to be planting. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but this is all the winter squash that I'm going to be growing because I am a fanatic, apparently, about winter squash and pumpkins. Uh, I kind of knew this already about myself, but I didn't realize that it was that big of a deal for me. Uh, I can't help myself apparently. So, uh, though these are, this is the list of my vegetables. So I'll go through that, uh, with you right now. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to be doing, uh, many rotations in the garden this year. So I've got stuff already planted, seedlings in trays, uh, getting ready to go out for my early spring harvest. Uh, so those are going to be things like cabbage and broccoli, uh, lettuce, spinach, carrots, beets, radish, stuff like that. Uh, and then I'm going to also have another uh, harvest of cold weather crops in the fall. And so uh, I'm going to get two crops out of those and then I'm going to have that big long summer period where I'm going to be able to have, you know, the really the warm stuff like the eggplants and the tomatoes and the peppers and the corn and, and things like that. So uh, let me start off with cabbage. 
please excuse me if I pronounce all these wrong because like I've said before, I only ever just read these. <laughs> I, I watch a lot of videos, but not often do you hear people talk about the specific varieties that they're growing. And so I only just read these things. I will do my best to pronounce some of them. Some of them are super easy, like Brad's Atomic Grape Tomato. I mean, that's not hard, but um, Anyway, apparently the first one that I'm reading is going to be more uh, difficult for me, uh, so <laughs> please give me some grace. Okay, so uh, for my cabbage, I have four varieties that I'm going to be growing. Uh, a couple of these are better for fall planting, and a couple are good for uh, spring planting, and then some are good for both. So we've got um, Viola, Violancio. <laughs> Here we go. See, it, it's starting already. Violanzo Cio de, de Verona. Here, let me just show you the spelling. Okay, so here we are. Violacio, Violacio, maybe? De Verona. Uh, and then I also put next to it uh, how many days until harvest. And so uh, the longer days ones, like the Brunswick, um, those are going to be ones that I plant uh, in late summer and then harvest in the fall. Uh, and so things like Early Golden Acre and Red Express, those have a harvest date of 60 to 65 days, um, both of them pretty much the same thing. And I also, I like to put on my list little notes that are important. So I know that nasturtiums are really good to grow with my cabbages. And so I need to make sure that as I'm planting those, I put nasturtiums in those beds. And so uh, I have, I have my, I don't have my, I need to find my, okay, I'll be right back. Okay, so I found them. So I have my list of when they, uh, the harvest dates, right? And so now I also have a map of my, my main two vegetable garden beds in the garden this year are going to be planted in a square foot manner as well as a permaculture manner. So I'm going to be doing lots of uh, interplanting. Not all the uh, broccoli is going to be in one area, not all the... Um, carrots are going to be in one area or the beans or anything like that. So um, in April, uh, this is where I'm going to be planting and how many, each square is a square foot. So I know one plant per square foot here. And so these are the things that I need to have done as far as planting uh, into seedling trays. What I need to do this month and then uh, for the month of April, and then in my sow trays, which are what I need to be planting into trays so that they can be ready to go uh, the next month in May. Now, I only labeled things that I'm changing each month, so I don't have to keep going over what's going on up here, and then it's less confusing for me. So you'll see in May, there's less on my on my garden plan, uh, but those are the things that I you know, see beets right here and radish, they go really quickly. And so I'll be able to have beans go in there as soon as I harvest those. And in May, we start getting really warm. And so the beets and the radish aren't going to like it as much there. I am adding one more big long bed that I have in the food forest that I kind of use as a vegetable bed sometimes. I've used it mostly as a potato bed, but since we have, um, we're going to be doing the Ruth Stout method, potato beds out in the field this year, I now have all this space free. And so these are going to be zucchinis and squash and corn and things like that. I'm going to put sunflowers around. I don't like to put too many sunflowers in my garden because I, I know they're so good. And so I do put some, but where the seeds drop, there is a, a chemical in those seeds that uh, kind of produces a growth inhibitor for anything else in the area. And so I want to put those at the corners of my beds and not densely in the middle where they're going to spread their seeds everywhere. If they spread their seeds on the corner of the beds, uh, there's a good chance that a majority of the seeds, if they fall uh, before the, bead, the birds can get to them, or something like that, then they will fall into the pathway. 
and so I don't have to worry too much about growth inhibitors in the pathway. But there are some really great beneficials that live on the dried up husks of sunflowers throughout the winter and then they come back and especially for people who would have a food forest like myself, um, things like coddling moth for my fruit trees uh, is something that I want to be prepared for and so this special uh, bug, I forget its name right now, I should look that up, um, the special uh, predatory bug lives in the old husk of the sunflower stalk uh, throughout the winter and that's the only place that it can survive and so uh, in the spring then it emerges and it helps um, repel any of the cotyledons or destroys them if they come because they eat them. So I do like to have sunflowers and I you'll see in a lot of my videos my garden looks crazy messy in the winter because I don't clean anything out. I leave everything in there uh, and then I only start cleaning things out once things start getting warmed up for the spring so that I know that things that, that overwintered in those habitats um, or the birds might need those seeds throughout the winter, uh, those are there for them during the months that they need them the most and then I can replenish and put new plants in and then they'll have more um, to live from uh, that summer and again uh, in the winter I'll leave those in and so it looks messy in the winter uh, but that's fine by me it is as I like to say controlled chaos or planned chaos okay so you'll see that I only have sunflowers in a couple of spots and they're all in the corners of the beds here um, I have my garlic interplanted with the zucchini and the corn um, I'm not doing beans, I'm not doing the Three Sisters thing because I've had bad experience with that and this year's theme is production so I don't want to make any trial and errors that are going to cost me the production of my corn like it did the last time that I did this. So these are my these are my spreadsheets for uh, what it should at a quick glance look like each month of the summer as I'm planting or not just the summer but there's the fall. This is my favorite one. Look at September. All that is, it's not even a map, it's just harvest. Nothing else to do, just harvest. October, harvest. Look at all that that I'm going to be able to harvest in October. And then November, even in November, there's going to be some stuff to be harvested. It's very exciting for me to look at that at a glance. Uh, this is a garden. Anyway, I also have another list because I am the list queen and that's what I do. So I made a list of not the varieties, but all the different types of things that I'm going to be growing. So all the beets, you know, one category for beets, cucumber. So I can kind of get a list of what kind of things do I need to be looking at for recipes for canning or drying or um, things like that. How do I, how do I preserve things? And then also it gives me a good idea. Do I have too many uh, squash or stuff like that. Uh, I can look on my varieties, but with this I just know I've got squash and I'll be able to use things for that. I did need to know what my climbers were though, so I had enough trellises or or uh, things for my, my climbers to grow up. Um, I don't know if you can see. Here we go. Um, I have a tomato trellis and it's really just a line on my on my plan here. Uh, because it's going to be two or maybe four poles uh, with pipe going through the top of them and then strings hanging down. So it's not going to take up a whole lot of space. Uh, I also have some for my cucumber, one over here, and these are in my herb beds. Um, the ones outside these main uh, garden squares or rectangles here. I have an eggplant trellis, more eggplant, uh, and then another eggplant down here. I just... I love eggplant so much. It's it's delicious to me. I know some people don't like it, but it is wonderful, I think. And then also I have another list uh, that I totally ripped when I was pulling it out, but I just kind of wanted a quick glance, like what's going in in the early spring, uh, what's going in in the spring after our last frost date, uh, and then what's going in the summer and then late summer. And so this was a great way for me to wrap my head around being able to make this. So I had my list of my harvest dates next to everything. And so, and then I also have my general list and then I have this. And then even more detailed, 
<sighs> I have my cute little puppy and, and kitten calendar. But I have on here days that are really good for, uh, that go with the lunar the lunar days. And so I can keep this calendar next to my bed and say, oh my goodness, I need to do uh, root crops um, on April 7th. This is something that's really important. If I'm going to fertilize my garden, I know that according to the moon cycles, fertilization of the garden is going to be best from the 2nd and through the 6th. Uh, if I'm going to do transplanting, I should do it on the 5th. Um, am I going to plant my above ground veggies on the 13th? And so keeping the lunar dates in, in the whole scheme of things is really important to me. Um, biodynamic gardening is, is something that's important to me. And so in order to be able to plant according to the lunar days, know when to harvest things so that I'll have uh, empty spaces in the garden where new things need to go in, like the beets and the radishes are going to be coming out so I have a space for the beans. When I need to have things in seedling trays, um, I just really needed to have like a general list and then this calendar is going to be basically my Bible uh, this summer as I go through and know what to do each day. And so I've got it all laid out until and through October, September. So there we go. That's how I do that. Let me tell you about the rest of my varieties of vegetables. Okay, so uh, I have the four cabbages. Uh, and now I looked, the theme of the garden this year is definitely production. I want to be able to produce things. I want to produce a lot of it in the amount of space that I have. You, you saw I only have about three main beds that I'm going to be planting in. And only two of those are really going to be highly intensely planted. The rest of them that last third one is is just going to be sitting there with summer squash uh, and corn for most of the year. So I'm not going to be transplanting a whole lot of stuff in there. Uh, so the theme is production in a small amount of space. What can I get the most bang for my buck for? What is going to be the most disease resistant and reliable so that I know that if I plant something, I'm pretty much going to be guaranteed to get a good crop of, off of it. And then also uh, the third category for that theme was also, am I going to be able to store these things? So I'm not going to plant a ton of things that don't go into a lot of recipes, uh, that don't store in a cold storage. So we're going to be building a root cellar this year on top of all the other things that we're doing this year. <laughs> go big or go home, right? At least that's what we do here. So it's fun when the, when the work is fun, you can get a lot of stuff done. Okay, so spinach, uh, I've got the long-standing Bloomsdale, and then uh, I'm going to be throwing some strawberry spinach seeds out, not in the main garden. I don't want those there. I just want to play with them a little bit. So I've got like some bare dirt all by itself somewhere else because I've heard they spread and, they, and they're and they kind of invasive a little bit. And so I'm going to have like a special way off to the side sp uh, spot for the strawberry spinach. But I do like to experiment sometimes, and so this is one of my ways that I'm going to be able to do that. Uh, I'm going to be growing parsnips this year. Really, the only kind that I'm going to be growing is hollow crown. Uh, I've heard really good things about that one. I'm excited to try it this year. Uh, turnips, we're going to be doing white globe. And then uh, just your regular garden turnips. I got it in a seed swab. It says right, regular turnips. So that's we're planting it. Uh, okay, and then peppers. I love peppers. My family loves peppers. My son, he basically will just eat peppers all day long and only that if I let him. Uh, so we like to freeze our peppers. We like to dry our peppers. We like to can our peppers. We like to eat our peppers fresh. We like to stuff our peppers. We will do a lot of pepper eating. Now, since my son really likes to go out there in the garden and just grab peppers off the plant and just eat them right there, I make sure that there are no spicy peppers in my main garden area. And then I kind of section off my herb uh, peppers. And all I do is I grow cayenne pepper and paprika. Those are the only two spicy ones that I grow because I want to have those for my medicines and I want to have that for my, my herb rack. And so when I cook, I can use those. So for my peppers, we're doing lilac bell. <sighs> okay, that one's just because it's pretty. 
I mean, it does taste good, but it's not like the most prolific or the best tasting ever, but it, it's really pretty. So we're doing Lilac Bell. We're doing a bunch of sweet pep, uh, sweet bell peppers. Um, obviously the paprika, like I said, uh, we've got the Golden California Wonder. Uh, we've got the Aleppo. Uh, we've got red, orange, yellow bell peppers that all goes with like the sweet bell pepper category. Uh, King of the North. Uh, which I really love from Baker Creek. That's a really good one. Um, and then the cayenne pepper. And I use the long, the long skinny uh, cayenne. Uh, I just find that that's incredibly prolific and it's always dependable. So uh, I plant the pepper seeds early. Tomato seeds I plant like uh, middle, beginning of, beginner, beginning of April, middle March. Those are going to be going in soon. But the peppers... And like the eggplant, I plant um, much, much earlier than that so that I can give them as much of a head start. And I transplant them into bigger and bigger pots, getting them ready, uh, giving them more space as they grow so that they're nice and big when I put them out in the garden. And they have as long of a period of time as they can uh, to really like just bush out and get as much fruit on them as possible. Okay, so then tomatoes are a big deal because, you know, canning tomatoes, um, drying tomatoes, tomatoes in soups, pastas, everything, um, there's going to be a lot of tomato canning going on. And so uh, there are so many wonderful tomatoes out there, and I could grow some that are not as prolific that taste even better than what I have on this list. But what I went with was the highest producing um, and then the be best tasting out of that category of the highest producing tomatoes. And so, uh, and also what can I use to store? So a lot of, a lot of these are going to be like paste tomatoes, um, or big tomatoes that are going to be easy for me to process. It is difficult for me to process cherry tomatoes, although we are going to have those in the garden as well. So, uh, as far as the processing can, uh, canning tomatoes, uh, I have Rio Grande, uh, Alice's Dreams, uh, Goldie Tomato, Striped Roma, Homestead, uh, San Marzano, Amish, <laughs> Amish, sorry, Amish Paste, uh, Enrica Pantano Romanesco. <laughs> Please give me grace on how I say these. Uh, Yoder's Yellow German, uh, Curry de Toro, Roma, and Rudiger's. Uh, I, I really like Rudiger's very, very much. And then Yoder's Yellow German is just like, got to be one of my favorite tomatoes of all time. Uh, we have a couple of cherry tomatoes. We're going to be doing Berries Crazy and then Super Sweet 100. And again, that's for production case. So with the cherry tomatoes... Uh, I don't skin them. I don't, I don't squeeze them or anything. I just throw them in a bag, put them in the freezer. And, uh, and then I use those to make pasta sauces and stuff like that. If I want to make a pasta sauce that day and just kind of let it simmer all day, I'll use those, those cherry tomatoes that I froze. And it just, it's, it's amazing. Absolutely incredible. So that's those. Uh, and then well, I have a list here for sunflowers. You don't need to know that though. Uh, we're talking about vegetables today. I can do a, a flower, a flower seeds, uh, thing later. Okay. So our winter squash. Yay. I really, I just love pumpkins so much. I love them. I love them. I love them. And I'm so excited about it this year because I've been holding off on planting pumpkins for about two years because we had really bad squash, squash bugs. And so one year, the first year that I did my garden, uh, I planted tons of squash, summer squash, winter squash, uh, and, and the bugs, uh, started. I did a really bad job of keeping up with them because I was a newbie and I literally made every mistake in the book, uh, if not more. And then um, the next year I planted them again and the bugs were just so overwhelming and disgusting and uh, squash bugs are so disgusting. And we have the stink bugs and they're kind of almost the same thing and it was just disgusting. So uh, I held off for the next two years on planting any of those squash type things so that I could 
hopefully destroy that life cycle of the squash bugs. And it was so hard to not plant these things that now that I'm giving myself the go ahead, my list for squash is just ridiculous, but I'm very excited. Uh, the lavender hill that I'm growing, um, on the side of the mountain there, half of it is going to be planted with lavender this year. And then the other half of that garden is going to be all pumpkins and winter squash. And since we're going to have a root cellar, uh, that was another big factor as well, because I'm going to be able to store all of these, um, these winter squash in the root cellar. And again, with the theme, it had to be prolific. It had to store well, specifically for the, the winter squash. Uh, and then um, I had to be able to use it, want to use it. It had to be good. So um, we've got some fun ones that are just going to be for decoration, but then the rest of them are, are more for um, storage and eating. So Big Macs, you got to have those for the kids, right? Uh, and then we've got Red Curie, which I'm super excited about. Uh, apparently that one tastes like chestnut and so that's going to be wonderful and it's a really good keeper. Um, I could say that about most of these actually. Uh, Connecticut field, Connecticut field pumpkin, uh, red warty thing. It's basically because it's the most beautiful pumpkin I've ever seen that in the white flat bore pumpkin. I'm going to be growing those just because I think they're the most gorgeous things I've ever seen. Uh, winter luxury pie, um, and then I got a package of seeds in my seed swap that just said white pumpkin. And I thought, yes, I want that. So I'm planting that. I have no idea what it is, though. So. Uh, the flat white boar, which is really good. It's also delicious, but it's the most beautiful pumpkin I've ever seen. Uh, jumbo pink squash. I haven't tried that before. I'm, I'm excited about it. a lot of these I haven't tried before. So I went for a lot of variety. I'm going to plant about two, two plants per variety and then see what happens. Uh, Kusha, uh, the Buen Gusto de Horno, uh, Sweet Meat, Acorn, uh, Kabocha, my arm's starting to get tired. I have too many seeds to read. Uh, Sweet Meat, Acorn, Kabocha, uh, Delicata, Spaghetti, because I mean, seriously, delicious. You can't not grow that. Sweet dumpling. Uh, we've got the Waltham butternut, um, blue Hubbard squash, which is also gorgeous. We're going to have the most beautiful front porch display of pumpkins this year, as long as I can keep those squash bugs away. Uh, Crespo squash, Tokyo squash, uh, Moringa squash. Uh, okay, here we go. Musky de Provence, maybe pumpkin. Some people call it the Cinderella pumpkin. We're going to just do that. Uh, Marina de Di Chio, Chiogia. I hope somebody knows what I'm trying to say there. Chiogia pumpkin. Uh, Rouge, Rouge, Vif. De, okay, I was a Spanish person. Like, like, I took Spanish in high school. I did not take French. So a lot of these pumpkins have French names, and I'm butchering it, I'm sure. Uh... Rouge Vif de Tamps pumpkin, another kind of Cinderella pumpkin, and then a cacao squash. So uh, a lot of these are also highly pest resistant. I'm hoping that that's true for my my area as well. Uh, and then we've got our summer squash, and the summer squash is basic zucchini. Uh, Where we do the rampiacante, which is just it's. It's delicious and it's wonderful and it did so well against the pests on that second year where the pests were just ridiculous. I still got a really good harvest off the Rampi Acante and it's a climbing zucchini so I can put this in my vegetable garden, put it on a trellis and I don't have to worry about it spreading out all over the garden. Um, that's just that's just delightful to me and it's and it's really cool looking. It's a really long, it's like a long gourd and then there's like a ball at the bottom but it, it Oh, it's so long. And, and when you walk under a trellis with those hanging down, it, it's magical. So then we've got uh, yellow straight neck, of course. We've got the white scallop because delicious. And then lemon squash again. I just love squash. Delicious. All of it is delicious. Uh, melons. That was a really hard for, thing for me to decide because there are so many different kinds and they're so delicious all together. So... 
I started off with a lot of uh, melons that I was going to grow, realized I didn't have enough room, so I had to pare it down because I was going to give priority to the things that stored well, like the winter squash. Uh, and so uh, I ended up really having to pare these down, so I think that this is a really good list. We've got the uh, PMR Delicious 51 that we're going to be growing, uh, the Minnesota Midget Cantaloupe, the Alibaba Watermelon, and that's from Baker Creek, if you want to look at that one. That's that's really cool. Uh, Orange Glow Watermelon. Uh, Crimson Sweet and Charleston Gray. Oh, and then also we're going to be doing a Banana Melon. See how that goes. goes. That one is a little bit more of an experiment. I'm not sure how that's going to go. Peas. We're not big on, on storing peas. I just like to eat them from the garden. So do the kids. So we've got Sugar Snap and Sugar Pod. Uh, radish, we're doing black radish because of the medicinal qualities for that. Uh, and then daikon, I'm going to put the daikon radish in the food forest and add that to my guilds. And then we've got the lady slipper. We're not huge radish fans, but I like to have them to pickle. Uh, so we'll do that with the lady slipper ones. Okay, on to the next. So we've got, um, we've got beets. I will eat beets all day long. If you had asked me that five years ago, I would have said uh, you could not get me to eat a beet. But once you eat beets from your garden, it's a completely different experience than what you have from the grocery store. So we have Ruby Queen. We have the Detroit Dark Red. Uh, Fewer Kugel, which I'm really excited about that. I hope I said that right. And Bull's Blood. Uh, cucumbers. We have Cucamelon, Richmond Green Apple, uh, Muncher, Fanfare, and Ganju Bitter Melon. And the Bitter Melon is basically for the medicinal qualities there as well. And it's just cool looking. I mean, it really, it's cool. Uh, I haven't grown that before, and I'm excited for that. Uh, carrots, we have Black Nebula, Pusa, Radhira, Atomic Red, and the Corral Carrot. I think one of those, I think it's the, the Pusa, is supposed to have such a high vitamin content and it's also supposed to have some cancer fighting properties which is important to me because my my family is just riddled with cancer uh, and so if we can get that into our fresh food and I can get my kids to eat that and it comes in like a carrot a delicious carrot I mean why not we are doing celery uh, because I'm going to be doing um, uh, freezing vegetables or drying vegetables um, for soups and so celery is really important in soups to me. Uh, so we've got pink celery and then the dialine celery. I hope I said that one right. But the dialine celery um, is supposed to be super easy. Celery is just a difficult uh, crop to grow. Uh, broccoli, we've got the Waltham 29, Romanesco, it's gorgeous, and then the de Cicio? Cicho? De Cicho? I don't know. Anyway. Uh, onions, we're doing Kelsey and Australian. Uh, beans, okay, so this was a hard choice for the beans because uh, bush beans are incredibly prolific as like just in a vegetable in general. Uh, and so um, I went through a lot of research, looked at a lot of reviews, looked at a lot of different uh, varieties and compared and contrasted. And so these are the ones that I came up with. Um, if you're looking for disease resistance, uh, really good tasting, and then really high productivity, uh, this is the list for you. So we've got the Eureka Bush Bean Yellow, Strike Bush Bean, Green Bush Bean, Lena Cisco's B, uh, Bush Bean. These are basically all going to be bushes for a while. Uh, Royal Burgundy Bean, and then the Golden Wax Bean. Uh, I've got a couple of pole beans on here, uh, the asparagus yard long bean, and then the purple yard long pole bean. I, I just, those are delicious and they're really cool. Uh, contender bush bean and then the jade bush. My husband's home. It gets me so excited. I just love when he comes home. <laughs> it's nice being in love with your husband. We got a couple of gourds. We got the loofah and the Corsican, and those are basically just so uh, for my herb stuff. Uh, corn, we're going with the Golden Bantam, 12 row, Fisher's Earliest Sweet, and then we're doing some black popcorn. Uh, and then the eggplant, Chinese String, 
Thai lavender uh, frog egg, uh, Rosita, Diamond, and then Black Beauty. Uh, I said before, and I'll say it again, I love eggplant. Uh, Brussels sprouts, we're going to be doing the Long Island Improved and the Red Rubin because they're beautiful. And then rutabagas. We're going to be growing a ton of rutabagas using extra any extra space that we can find uh, as soon as things get harvested for the last time. And we're going to be growing rutabagas this year. Um, and those store well in the ground in your garden. And so you don't have to have storage, which is great because I don't. I mean, I'm going to have a root cellar. But at the moment, I literally don't even have a closet in my house. Uh, greens, we're going to be doing the butterhead lettuce, red Russian kale, mustard greens, May queen lettuce, and rocky top lettuce mix. And then I've got a few miscellaneous things. I've got a celtus that I'm going to be growing, uh, rainbow Swiss chard, and then green purslane. Uh, purslane is something that you need to grow. If you haven't grown it before, do it. You probably are already. <laughs> it's a weed in most places. Like 90% of gardens probably have purslane in it. But it's one of the most nutrient dense things that you can grow and it tastes amazing so um i got the seeds for it even though i have it growing everywhere because i just want to have a specific bed for it uh, and have that included so those are the vegetables that we're going to be having this year uh, i'll give you a list of what i'm going to be putting in the food forest because i'm just super excited about that and then later on, I'll do a video on what are the flowers that we're going to be putting into our food forest and the vegetable garden. Okay, so here are the uh, things that I'm going to be putting into the food forest. Uh, the new one that I'm making and then a few things that are going to go along the lavender garden and then a few things that are going to be going into the food forest that already exists. That's already getting pretty full. I, I packed a lot of stuff into that last year. Okay, so I ordered only one cherry tree because we already have several, uh, and there's not a whole lot that uh, we like to do other than just fresh eat the, the cherries. So um, I got a lapin sweet. Lapin? Lapin? Lapine? I don't know. Anyway, lapin sweet. Uh, but we did get several apples. Uh, the apples that we got are Golden Delicious, uh, Williams Pride. We got a wealthy apple. I'm very excited about that. Uh, our Kansas Black. Uh, okay, the one that I'm most excited about, honestly, is the Whitney Crab Apple. Uh, crab apples are supposed to uh, pollinate all the um, all the tree, the apple trees uh, around them. Uh, if you need something to pollinate your apple tree, get a crab apple tree. And the Whitney Crab Apple is specifically a uh, crab apple that has large and delicious apples, even though it's a crab apple. So, uh, and then also they smell amazing in the spring. When you have a crab apple tree growing and blooming in the spring, uh, you can tell even if you can't see it because you can smell it. Uh, and then it's just beautiful. And then we got two of the Enterprise. And then I've been putting in some uh, Jonathan's as well that I've got from Tractor Supply. We got a medlar tree. So for the medlar tree, we got the Breda Giant. Uh, and I'm super excited about medlars because um, they look like small pomegranates with like that end that comes out. Uh, and then they also have the, the taste and the consistency, um, well, specifically this one does, of spiced applesauce. So, I mean, who doesn't love applesauce? And then we have a couple of figs because I'm a figaholic. And so the ones that I got are Floria and the Desert King. I have to be very careful of the figs that I get because the zone that we are in is not necessarily conducive for figs. We are like, we are on the cusp of figs doing well uh, and figs not doing well at all. So I think that those should be a couple that are really good for our area. But I've got like six or seven different varieties out there so that hopefully at least one will do well, whatever your type of year that we have. Uh, and so I can have my figs to eat. Uh, I got some hybrids this year, uh, and I'm, <laughs> I went a little crazy with those. I'm excited about it though. We got a sugar twist pluary. We got a delight cherry plum, uh, a Bella Gold picotum, peach apricot plum together. Um, we got a sprite cherry plum, a summer delight aprium, a spicy nectar plum and a flavor plant, favor, I'll see if I can say this right, 
flavor punch plum cherry. And so um, those are the ones that we got that are hybrids. Uh, of the apricots, I got a Wenatchee, Wenatachi, I'm never going to be able to say that right. Wenatachi, I think, Moor Park apricot. I got a, of the peaches, I got two. I got a Blushing Star and a Red Haven. Um, I'll probably end up picking up another Red, ha Red Haven at Tractor Supply because I saw that they have those. Um, and Nectarine, I got a Harco. I'll probably end up getting another couple of those from Tractor Supply because I love Nectarines and you can dry those and you can have those all year. Uh, and then we got a couple of hazelnuts, uh, which I'm super excited about. We got a Webster, a McDonald. I have a couple of hazelnuts already growing, um, but I just, I love hazelnuts. You can't have too much. Uh, we got a couple of almonds because I just discovered this winter because, you know, you can't not research stuff. Uh, but almonds do well in our area here in the Appalachian Mountains of Virginia. Very surprising to me. So we got a all-in-one almond and a dessert to knee. Dessert knee? Dessert knee. Desert knee. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, like that. Kind of, kind of like that. Uh, I got a couple of medicinal trees. I got a linden little leaf and an American uh, linden tree. And then for our pears, I got a seckle pear because those are supposed to be absolutely delicious. And a red claps favorite. And then I got some bush type fruit. So I got uh, a couple service berries, um, two different types. I got a regent service berry. And then I have one in the window over there. I, I should figure out what that is. Um, but I just got that. It's a, it's a generic service berry from Tractor Supply. Uh, blueberries. I got a bunch of blueberries. Uh, South Moon, Sunshine Blue, Elliot, Liberty, Legacy, North Blue, and Patriot. Uh, and so some of those are supposed to be big, some are supposed to be evergreen, some do really well. I did my best to do early spring harvest, spring, summer, and then fall. And then there's even a really late fall harvest type of blueberry in that list. And so we'll have something going on the entire year as far as blueberries go because we are blueberry lovers and they freeze well and they do well in literally everything. Uh, we got a few huckleberries. I got a native star evergreen huckleberry. I actually got six of those. I'm going to turn that into a hedge, a, a kind of a, a screen blocker between my in-law's house and our house. Uh, because why not make a screen that you're going to be uh, growing edible too? I mean, and then we got a buried treasure box. I also got a wintergreen cherry berries for. Uh, uh, a ground cover uh, and then raspberry I got a emerald carpet ground cover raspberry it grows along the ground I'm, I'm excited about that we got two of those some black cap raspberries meekers all of these are coming as as groups of plants so uh, there's a lot of raspberries coming we do not like blackberries so we're not growing those uh, can be thornless fall gold ever bearing and then jewel black cap and then I got two blue elderberries, which is native to the Washington coast, uh, but they should do well here as well. Uh, and then we got an ivory column bamboo. It's a clumping bamboo, which is a big deal because bamboo is so useful and so nice to have, and it's so beautiful, uh, but you don't want it to overtake your entire property, right? So the answer is clumping bamboos that stay compact, um, very easy to manage. If they spread at all, it's very minimal and you can cut it back easily. So it's not a spreading bamboo, it is a clumping bamboo and you can still have all the benefits of growing bamboo on your property without worrying about your whole property turning into a bamboo forest and your neighbors getting very angry at you. And then we also got seven sugar maples just because why would you have a forest and homestead without sugar maples, honestly. So that is what we have ordered, purchased uh, 
for seeds and for plants this year. I will do another video on the flowers that we're going to be doing because um, I am having a cut flower garden this year. We are doing a lavender hill. Um, and I just like to put flowers everywhere. So we have lots of pollinators coming in and it's beautiful and it just smells amazing too when you're walking in a garden filled with flowers. So um, if you have any questions about anything, uh, let me know. I'll put a link to the places where I got my fruit trees and my berry bushes uh, and the bamboo and stuff like that uh, in the video below. So if you guys are interested in any of those, you can easily find them. Uh, but I hope this helped. Uh, anybody, if you're hemming and hawing about something, I hope it helped give you a little bit more clarity or direction or, or even gave you some new ideas about something that you might want to try. Anyways, have a wonderful day and stay blessed.